Thank you very much, Ashley, for that very kind introduction. Um, I welcome all of the TIBI alumni uh, who are joining us today. Uh, thanks for being here, and uh, thank you for your continued engagement with the TIBI College of Business. It's really wonderful to have you all here. I'm very delighted to be sharing some of my work with you on consumer experiences in virtual reality, um, and specifically on how immersion in these experiences affects consumers' perceptions of products. So we all know that we are living in an era where our lived experiences are increasingly mediated by technology. So what I'll be showing you today is some of my, some of my work on how uh, we can construct these virtual experiences to be the most effective for consumers. To begin, I'd like to start off with just a simple poll. So what you'll see here on the screen are three categories of Instagram photos, category A, B, and C. And what I'd like you to think about is which set of these Instagram photos would you expect to receive the most number of likes on Instagram? So which do you expect to receive the most consumer engagement? I'll have you take a moment and think about that. Um, cast your vote and then I will uh, share out the results of the poll. All right, let's see, here are the results. So a pretty even distribution here. So we see that about 31% of you are saying that you believe category A um, photos will receive the most consumer engagement. About 28% of you said category B photos you thought would um, get the most likes. And then about 41% of you said category C photos. Uh, in a moment, I will reveal for you uh, what our data say, um, but let's look at these categories more carefully. So what you'll notice about the category A photos is that in each of these photos, there's a focal product, um, but there is no hand present in any of those images. In the category B photos, you'll, you'll notice that there are hands that are present in those images, but those hands are not in contact with any product. But in the category C photos, you'll see that there's a focal product and the hand is physically touching the product. This is the phenomenon that I'll be talking about today, um, which is called vicarious touch. Uh, it's the observation of a hand in physical contact with a product in a digital environment or in virtual reality. Um, this is really the phenomenon that I'm interested in studying um, in, in these virtual domains. And so what I'll be showing you today is, is some of how I've studied this topic um, using both brands, social media data, um, as well as in a custom virtual reality retail store that we've crafted specifically for this research. So to begin um, kind of investing Investigating this question, um, I started by collecting Instagram data from large brands. So the brands that I selected were Caribou Coffee, Samsung, Starbucks, and We Are Knitters. Each of these brands has a presence on Instagram. Um, and you'll notice that each of these brands also has a handheld product. So I didn't select brands that are financial institutions, for example, right? I did not select Wells Fargo because they likely will not be displaying um, any social media content with a product in one's hands. I intentionally selected brands uh, that have products that could plausibly de be displayed in, in a consumer's hand. And then I focused specifically on the posts that had the focal product in it. So for example, Samsung often creates uh, Instagram posts with beautiful scenery, like the, the picture of the boat here. Um, these types of posts were not really in um, uh, what we were interested in studying in this, in this study. And so uh, those types of posts were not uh, investigated. But what I did was we had research assistants who looked through all 4,500 of these posts and then coded them on a variety of different dimensions, including whether the brand's products were um, 
were present, whether there were hands present in these images, uh, whether the hands were touching the products. Um, and so we wanted to be able to investigate this effect of, of touch. In addition, we had a whole variety of other coatings where we wanted to make sure that um, the effects of touch that we were looking at um, weren't potentially being driven by some other um, aspect of the photos themselves. So we coded for things like um, inferences of gender simply from the depiction of the hands. Uh, we coded for race of the hands. We coded for whether the hands were originating from the perspective of the self or whether it was originating from the perspective of the other person. Um, we coded for whether it was just a, an arm or a hand in the photo or whether there were other body parts present. Um, we coded for whether or not a post was a regram or not. So whether the post essentially originated by um, someone else who created the content and then was um, propagated on Instagram. So we, we coded for a whole variety of different um, characteristics of the post, um, and we wanted to control for those when we were actually testing this um, statistically. So what do we see? Uh, we see that brands receive higher engagement uh, when they use vicarious touch in their Instagram photos. Um, and this effect is positive and significant. Um, when we control for all of those other factors that could be also driving this effect, um, all of those things that I just mentioned, what we see is that effect of touch is still positive and significant. That effect remains. Um, and so we really can see from this, we can tell that the, the number of likes that a brand should expect to receive on their Instagram photos will be significantly driven by whether or not there's a hand in physical contact with their products. Um, so to go back to this initial poll, if you selected uh, category C, uh, you, you were right. So touch posts received on average 65% more likes than those that did not show touch. Um, so this category is engaged with more frequently. If we look at the relative effects of each of these categories, what you'll notice is that the vicarious touch posts compared to posts with no touch, so the category C versus the category B, you'll notice that the, the relative effect on likes is, again, positive and significant. So that's uh, that particular comparison also holds. The effect of vicarious touch compared to no hand posts. So for example, the category C versus category A. Again, this is also very highly significant and positive. So those touch posts uh, relative to both no touch and no hand, uh, we find statistically significant effects here on boosting likes. And we see no significant difference between uh, posts that have hands that are there but not touching the product and having posts where they don't include hands at all. So you might be wondering, okay, well, is it the case that brands are you know, creating just a few posts that show touch and perhaps maybe those few posts are just garnering a ton of engagement, right? So perhaps the engagement is really concentrated within just a, a small subset of, of posts that show touch. Or is it the case that brands frequently create social media content with vicarious touch? So we can actually answer this by going back to our Instagram data and just running simple descriptive statistics. Um, what, we'll, what we see across these, again, 4,500 uh, images on Instagram is that about 43.2% of all of the images across these brands display vicarious touch. So of all the posts where the focal product is present, 43% of those posts are showing a hand interacting with that product. Uh, when I first saw this uh, statistic, it was actually pretty surprising to me. Um, I, I believe that the phenomenon existed, but I wasn't as convinced that um, that, that percentage would be as high as it is. Um, but indeed, this is uh, uh, something that brands are doing, and it also speaks right to the prevalence with which we're actually seeing this on, on Instagram. If you go and pull up um, Starbucks Instagram feed right now, uh, you probably won't have to scroll too far before you'll find a, a pumpkin spice latte being held by, you know, some manicured hand. So um, you'll see this uh, now that you are, are aware of it. 
So to study this a little bit more systematically, um, uh, I conducted a, a, a series of experiments. Um, and to really understand why this, this effect occurs, um, we can kind of turn to the academic literature and understand what we know about, about touch in general. Um, there's a lot of really wonderful work in sensory marketing on how various, uh, various aspects of touch can influence consumers' attitudes and behaviors. Um, sometimes uh, touch is referred to as haptics or touch by the hand. Um, and what we know from a lot of this uh, prior work is that just simply touching a product can facilitate product evaluation in a retail store. So if you simply touch a product, people tend to uh, evaluate those products more favorably. Uh, the sense of touch also increases what we call psychological ownership. Um, psychological ownership is the feeling that something is mine. So we can feel a sense of psychological ownership even when we don't legally own something. So simply touching a product engenders the sense of psychological ownership in consumers. They tend to feel more like it's their product. We also see that touch influences impulse purchasing. We know that it increases purchase confidence. So if people feel more confident in their decision-making after having been able to touch products. Um, but what's interesting is that a lot of these effects of touch are very positive when someone themselves gets to touch a product. But we also know that people really don't like when other people touch their own products or, or products that they are thinking about buying. So consumers will actually experience disgust if other people touch products. Um, you may notice that when you're shopping in a, in a store, maybe you, you yourself or maybe you've seen someone else um, reach to the back of the store shelf, right, to, to select a product rather than selecting the front facing item, right? This is kind of getting at this idea that people don't want the, the products that are touched by others, right? They want the untouched product. They want the clean version, the fresh version. Um, and presumably, right, that fresh version is coming from the back of the store shelf. Again, this is a phenomenon that you'll see over and over again. So if we think about this in the context of vicarious touch, um, one thing that could happen is that you might think about that hand that you are seeing touching the product. You might feel as if it's your own hand and you might have some positive benefits of touch from, from seeing that hand. On the other hand, if you're construing this as the hand of someone else, then perhaps that touch could be negative, right? Perhaps you could be experienced, experiencing disgust from seeing that hand touching a product. And so um, as we kind of set out on this, this work, it wasn't even clear which direction um, this should go. One thing that we know about touch though is that touching products is, an, is active, right? It, it affords an observer visual cues. Um, and people touch products for all sorts of different reasons. So um, a very instrumental or kind of purpose-driven form of touch is really to assess haptic properties, right? You might feel the texture of a sweater to know if it's scratchy or if it's soft. Um, people also touch just for fun, for hedonic reasons. So um, in store, people will do things like running their hand along a rack of clothing um, for no particular purpose other than to enjoy the sensory experience of it. But what's interesting is that our sense of touch is really good at getting certain haptic properties, but these haptic properties also necessitate there to be certain hand movements that go along with getting this haptic information, right? So if you think about getting the texture of a sweater, um, your hand would be engaging in what we call lateral motion. So that's if your hand is going like this across the top of a sweater, or maybe in between your fingertips, you're actually moving your fingers over the fabric to assess the texture of it. Uh, you also get a lot of different haptic information like hardness, right? A lot of people go into grocery stores and they'll pick up an avocado and they'll apply pressure, right? They'll squeeze it to understand, is this ripe? Um, is it too hard? Right? Uh, that's a very common exploratory procedure. People also assess weight of products, um, and they do so by picking up the product and hefting it, or it's called unsupported holding. So this movement of the hand will give you the weight of an item. Um, weight is really important for 
products like flatware, right? People care about how, how um, the, the silverware might be um, weighted. Or we can assess temperature using, um, using touch, right? Just by applying static contact to something, um, you actually can get the, the temperature. But what you'll notice is that all of these are active movements. So from the perspective of actually observing touch, you get to see, an observer gets to see these visual cues that then give them information about um, what someone is doing regarding um, the, the exploration of these haptic properties. We also know that in um, these virtual worlds, uh, consumers can feel a sense of presence. So we know that people can feel transported into virtual worlds. There's a lot of really wonderful work um, on the sense of presence. Um, and we know that this can happen to the extent that people can actually feel more body ownership of virtual bodies. Um, so body ownership is the feeling that a body is my own and a part of me. Um, and we like as humans to feel as if we have effect in the world, right? That ourselves are um, having some sort of um, some sort of effect on our environment. Um, this is kind of the notion of authorship processing, which supports the perception of events and actions and thoughts as just as ascribed to the self as a causal agent. So we like to feel as if um, our actions are doing something for us. And it made me wonder whether seeing touch might actually be blurring the lines of what is our own body and what is a virtual body. A sense, in a sense, kind of facilitating this sense of body ownership. Um, and so this kind of led us to the questions, does vicarious touch in virtual reality affect a consumer's sense of body ownership of the virtual hand? Um, and is the mere presence of a virtual hand enough to affect product valuation or is touch really necessary? So we began to explore these um, across a series of experimental studies. Um, and the first of which I'll tell you about is, is a study that we conducted in virtual reality. Um, before I jump into what um, I did in virtual reality, I want to set some groundwork for what is virtual reality. So perhaps some of you um, are not really aware of what the differences are between these um, artificial or simulated environments. And so this gives us just some um, grounding and understanding of what this is. So virtual reality is a computer generated environment with scenes and objects, and one's actions must partially determine what happens in the space. Um, so you can see the photo shown there. Uh, this person is fully immersed in a virtual reality environment. He's wearing a headset. Um, and so he's full, it, he's fully immersed in a fully artificial world. Um, this is what we traditionally think of as virtual reality. Again, you can think of his head movements. He can look all around the virtual space. Those head movements are determining what happens in the space, um, as are his hand movements. This is different than augmented reality, which is a consumer gen uh, computer generated content that has been overlaid on a real world environment. So you can think of various apps that allow for augmented reality. Ikea is a common one where you can actually, uh, through your smartphone, um, have a armchair placed in the middle of your room, right? You can see what that armchair would look like in your actual real world space. So essentially the real world is enhanced or augmented with some sort of computer generated content. And then you have likely heard the term metaverse, which um, is being discussed quite extensively these days. It really refers to a 3D network of, of virtual worlds, a fictional universe where all these virtual worlds collide and are located. Um, and so people are talking about this as kind of the next frontier, right? And in, in terms of how people will engage with um, our virtual worlds. And it's a combination of the words meta and universe. Let me jump into um, thinking about how VR is actually being used currently in, um, in retail. So Goldman Sachs estimates that the market for AR and VR in retail is going to reach $1.6 billion by 2025. Um, and, and the retailing industry is, is thought to be one of the primary industry industries that's gonna be driving market growth in this area. 
Um, you can think about retailing alongside the gaming industry, alongside healthcare, as being really primary drivers of, of this market growth. Now, what's interesting is if we start to look at what some of the uh, early VR uh, retail experiences look like, uh, this is what we see. So eBay has um, created the first ever department retail uh, VR store, and this is what it looks like. So consumers are able to navigate through different departments. They're able to just through their eye gaze and where they look and where they place attention, um, they're able to select products and um, get more product information. Um, one thing you'll notice probably uh, based on what we've been talking about today is that in this environment, there's absolutely no semblance of self, right? So many of these current VR retail environments lack a semblance of self in the experience. There's no physical hand in the experience. There's no indication to the consumer that they themselves are in that experience. Um, and so seeing this, it kind of makes you realize, could, could some of these systems be better developed to actually make the consumer feel as if they are there, they're physically present in the space? And might virtual hands or virtual limbs help facilitate that for consumers? So we set out to answer this question ourselves. Um, and to do so, we created a custom VR retail store by contracting with a VR content creator. So we populated this scene with, um, with products and with uh, content that we wanted to include in this space. Um, it's a completely artificial space. Um, and then we tested this using experiments. And we tested this here in the Tippie College of Business Behavioral Research Lab. So um, I brought in undergraduate students into the behavioral lab. We put them in Oculus headsets uh, and VR headsets, and we, um, we assigned them to various conditions, and I'll show you what those are in a minute. But this is the 360 degree rendering of the VR retail space. So consumers could look fully around the store, explore it um, in the VR headset. Now, the first uh, condition that I'll show you is the, the touch condition that we created. We created various versions of the store to be able to test our effects experimentally. Um, what we wanted was, you can see we had these virtual hands that exist in the space. Again, we're wanting to make the consumer feel potentially as if um, they are physically present in this space. And you'll notice that the VR store approaches this red shirt and reaches out and touches it. Um, at that point, product information pops up and the VR retail experience continues and again the hand engages in lateral motion to feel the texture of that shirt. And so that's what that touch condition looked like. You'll notice the, the, the exploratory procedures that the hand was using to touch those products. We created a second version of the store, um, which was a no-touch version. So again, you see these virtual hands appear. Uh, the participant is aware that they are physically present with virtual hands in the experience. Um, the hand does not engage with the table right there, but again, still approaches this same red shirt. Um, and instead of reaching out and touching the, the product, the hand reaches out and grabs the pole on the shelf. The same product information appears for consumers to see. And uh, the, the VR environment continues on, right? And the hand, again, does not engage with the product there, but just simply rests on the shelf. So that was our no-touch version of our VR retail store. And finally, we developed a cursor version of this store. So you'll notice there are no hands in this condition. So no hands are present whatsoever. And instead, we have a cursor that highlights products as uh, the consumer is focusing on them. You'll notice that this cursor rendering um, was de designed intentionally to mimic what eBay is doing in their VR store. Um, again, the same product information was displayed, but again, no hands and certainly no touch. 
So our undergraduate participants were placed into one of three conditions, one of these three, um, and uh, were allowed to kind of explore this, this VR store. Um, at the same time they were in our virtual reality headsets, um, we also collected physiological measurement uh, from them. So um, here is are just some photos of one of our research assistants who is kind of posing as a as a participant, but this is what we saw. So while they were in the virtual reality headset, what exactly what they saw was was shown to us on the computer screen. And at the same time, we were capturing their heart rate. So we were interested to understand um, whether or not this physiological measurement could um, moderate our effects of touch, essentially. Um, there's some prior research that suggests that people who are particularly um, sensitive to these virtual worlds and particularly stimulated by them tend to see elevation in heart rate. So it's really an individual difference measure here, um, whether or not you are highly stimulated by these VR environments. And so we were interested in whether or not um, this individual difference measure could play, play a role in our effects. We also asked them after the experience and they took off the headset, they completed a variety of self-reported responses about the VR experience. So we asked them questions like uh, re related to their body ownership. These are just some sample items to give you an idea of what we were capturing. Um, their psychological ownership, I feel like it's my shirt. Um, their product evaluation, whether the shirt seemed to be of good quality. Um, their purchase intentions, their willingness to pay for the products, et cetera. So what we see is that vicarious touch does increase body ownership relative to the other two conditions. So people who saw the hand in VR reaching out and touching that red shirt felt a stronger sense of body ownership. They felt more like that virtual hand was theirs. So we see that vicarious touch in general heightens the sense of body ownership. They feel like that virtual hand is theirs. And this fosters a sense of psychological ownership, which is again, the feeling that something is mine. They're more likely to feel like that red shirt is mine when they feel a higher sense of body ownership. And this drives really important outcomes in terms of how consumers are evaluating products. So, so from this sense of psychological ownership, people feel uh, like the products are, are better quality, they like them more. Um, they report having higher intentions of purchasing the products. And they also report greater willingness to pay for the products. So to quantify that for you, uh, Vicarious Touch increases the willingness to pay uh, for the, the red shirt that they saw in this uh, in the VR environment. So you can see that um, those who saw the shirt touched were reported on average being willing, willing to pay $9.75, as opposed to those in the cursor and no touch conditions, uh, which were significantly less. So compared to not viewing touch, the no touch condition, those who viewed touch reported being willing to pay 32.5% more for the touch shirt. So it's a very simple action, right? But that can um, affect what consumers, um, how they're perceiving the products and what they're willing to pay for them. Now, interestingly, if we look at our heart rate data, again, there are some people for whom when they are in virtual experiences, they become particularly immersed and this is revealed through their heart rate. Um, and so what we see from our data is the individuals who are highly stimulated by the VR environment report a greater willingness to pay after viewing touch. So if you look at this X axis here, what you'll see is that this is a heart rate change measure. So as people's heart rate uh, change was positive, um, the effect of vicarious touch was positive and significant on willingness to pay, um, especially in relation to our no touch and our cursor conditions. So again, these, these people who are like very highly stimulated, touch was even better for them. Um, and it, it had more effects on, on their reported outcomes. We wanted to understand um, the nature of this effect more fully. And we wanted to try to figure out um, how might we kind of disrupt this effect of touch. So we can see in a lot of contexts here that 
touch is really good, right? It has these kind of positive effects in terms of how consumers are evaluating the products. Um, but we are wondering if this is all, always the case. Um, first, we wanted to know, does the phenomenon ex extend beyond VR or static images to other digital content? So we kind of vary the type of digital content that we created. And we wanted to know, does the effect of vicarious touch hold even for an unrealistic or non-human-like hand? And I'll show you what we did. So we ran this um, experimental study uh, online and we created essentially various um, GIFs, advertisement GIFs, um, like you might see if you were scrolling through one of your social media feeds. Um, and we created various versions. So we had a human hand either not touching the product or touching uh, the product, the sweater here. But we also created digital renderings of hands. Um, it's a blue hand, it's a disembodied hand. So uh, presumably, right, one could think, well, if, uh, if you can still feel body ownership of this blue disembodied hand, that would be pretty remarkable, right? But it's very plausible that maybe um, we could disrupt that feeling of body ownership and people might not be able to, to experience that sense um, uh, and have these kind of positive outcomes from viewing touch. We also created the hands in this way because this also resembles a lot of um, what we see in these virtual environments. It's actually very common in virtual reality to see floating hands. This is not an uncommon experience. It's actually uh, very prevalent. And so this also mirrors what um, is happening in actual virtual domains. And what we see is that regardless of the, the nature of the hand itself, it still fosters the sense of body ownership. So even for a blue disembodied hand, when it's engaging with the product, as opposed to when it's not, when there's no touch, we see that this fosters a sense of body ownership. And again, the same effects carry out even in this context. So it's, it heightens a sense of psychological ownership of that sweater. Um, it affects your product evaluations of the sweater. Um, the likelihood that you say you will uh, purchase the sweater, and again, your willingness to pay for that product. So even for this digitally created, very non-human-like hand, engaging in a way that, you know, simulates touch, um, but isn't, um, isn't an actual human hand, we still see these effects of touch. So we found that to be pretty remarkable, that um, even something like this could continue to see this effect of vicarious touch. Um, we had a whole variety of other studies, which I'll just kind of give you a, a sense for, um, but we wanted to understand, um, you know, the robustness of this phenomenon. We wanted to understand the generalizability of it, the conditions under which it occurs and under which it doesn't occur. Um, and so we tested this using a variety of product categories. So here we, uh, we don't just test it with, you know, clothing items, but we're here, we're testing it with a blanket. Again, the hand engaging in physical contact with that product. Uh, we also tested it varying uh, the skin tones of the hand touching products. Um, we see that touch, regardless of the skin tone, uh, is, is effective. It, it kind of boosts people's evaluations of the products, um, and people still feel transported into uh, virtual limbs that don't uh, resemble their own. What we do see is that um, when there's a congruence between uh, one's own skin tone and the displayed skin tone, uh, it tends to be easier to feel transported into that limb, but this is independent of touch. So it, it doesn't depend on whether or not touch is occurring or not. So our touch effect still remains, um, regardless of the depiction of, of the hand. We also tested this using a variety of different exploratory procedures. So you'll notice here the hand is picking up the watch and hefting it right, it's presumably getting the weight of that product. Um, so we use various exploratory procedures um, to test this. Uh, we still see the effects of touch. We even went so far as trying to make um, interventions in which uh, touch could plausibly be bad. Um, we took this actual CDC sign uh, that, say, that says germs are all around you. And we showed this to consumers 
uh, and to our participants. And uh, we reminded them of um, essentially contagious disease cues, right? We reminded people that hands can be dirty. Um, and then we showed them advertisements just like this of a hand touching a product. And again, to our surprise, touch was still good. <laughs> it still produced these positive effects, even when we made germs very salient for people. Again, speaking to the robustness of this effect, but also kind of speaking to the fact that people are construing this as their own hand. They feel as if it's theirs to some extent, more so than it's someone else's hand, right? So they're able to kind of feel this sense of transportation, even into these virtual limbs. Finally, we decided to test the nature of the hand movements. So we um, altered the nature of the hand itself in a variety of different ways. Uh, we are also interested in whether we can actually you know, alter the nature of the hand movement and whether that might actually uh, decrease the effectiveness of touch. So we were wondering, does the atypicality or the diagnosticity of the exploratory procedure attenuate this effect? So I'll show you what I mean. Um, so here we have a hand that's touching a product, but in a very atypical way, right? So um, if you want to get the the texture of a sweater, um, it's not very common, right, to run the back of your hand on it, or it's just a little bit more atypical, right? It's more common to kind of feel it in between your fingertips or to, to have a, a palm down lateral motion as opposed to a palm up lateral motion. So this atypicality of touch, we were wondering, you know, just because it's atypical, might people not really feel transported into that hand? Um, Turns out it still works. <laughs> so people still, even with this kind of strange touch, uh, they still feel transported into that hand. It still has these positive effects. So we're like, okay, there has to be something where we can actually turn this effect of touch off, where we can find a boundary condition that actually um, does not allow this vicarious touch effect to, to produce. And so we, we essentially found not just in an atypical form of touch, but we tested one that's also non-diagnostic. So meaning that it does not meaningfully assess some sort of haptic proper, property, and it does not meaningfully engage with the product in a natural way. Um, you can imagine knocking on a sweater is not a typical movement, but it's also non-diagnostic, right? So it does not actually do something meaningful with the product. Again, this is a test of how far does this effect extend? Is it any touch? So would knocking on a sweater help or, or produce this effect? Or can we um, attenuate this effect and have it go away? Turns out this is not helpful. <laughs> so um, which you might expect, right? So the non-diagnosticity of this uh, form of touch uh, interferes with people's ability to, um, to transport themselves into that virtual limb. Okay, so we've uh, tested this effect across a lot of different domains um, in a lot of different contexts, all within kind of a virtual space. Um, one thing to note is that many retailers have worked very extensively to craft and create in-store experiences for consumers that are engaging. Um, Apple is probably one of the foremost companies to do this, right? Their in-store retail experience is one that a lot of people enjoy. They have a very minimalistic design, very aesthetically pleasing. Uh, a lot of people come into these retail spaces and um, enjoy the space, enjoy the products. Um, and this has been designed with a lot of intention. So it's been reported that Apple instructs its employees at the beginning of every day to actually angle the laptop screens at a very precise angle. And you might be thinking, well, of course they do this to maintain their clean aesthetic or their, their symmetry or their lines. Um, and while that might be true to some extent, um, the, the very clever people at Apple also know that if they position the laptops at just such an angle, it encourages consumers to touch the products. So they get you to touch the products, to interact with them. They've created a space in which that's possible and it's encouraged. And they know that once they do that, they've got you, right? They have, um, they've locked you in, in terms of your interest in the product. And you're significantly more likely to buy uh, products after you've touched them.
So a lot of retailers are creating these spaces with um, high intention and intention around physical interaction with these products. When we're thinking about the construction of virtual spaces, um, it's not clear whether or not these virtual spaces are being constructed with such attention. But some of the research that I've just shown to you might suggest that thinking about these haptic experiences within a virtual reality domain um, could be a really promising and important aspect of the virtual experience for consumers. Now, our, our uh, access to VR uh, equipment, VR technology is only increasing. Um, just for a few hundred dollars, you can go out and purchase um, uh, one of the top of the line VR headsets uh, on the market. And many consumers are, are doing just that. Um, and a lot of companies are investing quite heavily into these, um, these new technologies, into hardware to support these technologies, and also into the creation of these virtual worlds for consumers to engage um, and use this technology. Um, and so it's becoming much more integrated into um, consumers' lives. And the accessibility is also there, um, also by having options that are more affordable. Uh, Google Cardboard has a $15 um, uh, option, which really lowers the barriers to adoption. So you can essentially create and turn any smartphone device into a virtual reality headset in which you can look around and engage with an environment um, as if you were wearing you know, one of these other headsets. So it really opens the doors to becoming more accessible to a wide range of consumers. If we think about the implications of, of my work specifically, um, what I've shown to you hopefully today um, makes you realize that the use of virtual hands is important for this immersive experience and to foster a connection with the environment. Um, it's really not sufficient for the virtual hand to just be there, right? It can't just be present. It needs to be engaging with the product and it needs to be engaging with the product in a meaningful way. Um, so that hand touching a product is very, very powerful, even when you're observing that hand. Uh, I also showed you that people have high need for stimulation. So people whose heart rate increases in these uh, virtual reality environments actually benefit the most from viewing touch. Um, so they're actually the ones that kind of uh, feel the most benefit from it. And if we think about the implications of this, um, of course there are implications for brands and companies creating content, but there are actually implications beyond that as well. Um, you think about all of the um, consumer created content that's out there that all of us consume on a, a daily basis. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Um, video category, categories like unboxing videos. Unboxing videos have gone from really relative obscurity to one of the, one of the most watched categories on YouTube, right? People spend a lot of time watching other people receive a package, open it up, um, remove the product from the packaging and interacting with the product, right? So increasingly consumers are reliant on the content creation of fellow consumers. And so this is just another example of how those vicarious experiences can really facilitate um, product evaluations uh, for other consumers, how these, how people can feel transported uh, into these experiences along with other consumers. And when, uh, when we're adapting to any technological change, one of the things that it's important to think about is what purpose action serves. Uh, action serves. So when we think about in-store retail experiences, uh, consumers can touch products, right? It provides haptic information. We know it increases psychological ownership. But when that actual touch is not physically available to consumers, we should start to think about, okay, well, what is right still available? What can still occur? And vicarious touch can still have these psychological benefits that we see from actual touch. Um, it's just if, if, if it's created and fostered in a particular way. So this research really suggests that, that vicarious touch can really help facilitate um, some of those um, product benefits that people would actually get if they were in person in a store. 
If you're interested to read more about this work, I uh, would encourage you to do so. Um, this project that I've presented today has recently been um, accepted for publication at the Journal of Marketing Research. It's called Observing Product Touch, the Vicarious Haptic Effect in Digital Marketing and Virtual Reality. Um, I would also like to acknowledge my excellent collaborators on this project, uh, Joanne Peck at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Bill Hedgecock at the University of Minnesota, and Yi Zhu at UC Berkeley. So with that, I will say thank you and keep in touch. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andrea. And we have uh, lots of questions coming into the Q&A. So keep those questions coming. We have about 10 minutes and we'll do our best to get to all of those. But if we don't address your question during this Q&A session, um, you can see that Andrea has shared her email. So please feel free to email her directly. Um, Andrea, our first question, um, I think you've spoken to this a little bit, but um, do does results of vicarious touch impact differ if the hand body ownership doesn't match my own hand body ownership? Yes, this is a great question. Um, and so what we would um, expect to see, right, is that in general, um, any rendering of a hand that's um, more similar to your hand might be more easily felt as if you can transport into it. And this is this is what we see. But in the context of what we're studying here with touch, the question of whether touch is better if the hand looks like yours versus it doesn't, that, that's where we actually don't see this effect, which is kind of surprising, right? And, and interesting. Touch compared to no touch is almost always better, regardless of what that hand looks like. Um, we've tested this very extensively um, and we've tested you know, pretty hyper masculine versions of hands. We've tested kind of hyper feminine versions of hands. Um, then we kind of adorn the hands with, you know, a very kind of masculine oriented watch or a more feminine one. And so we really kind of amp that up. And even those very gendered depictions of hands, people can feel, still feel transported and the touch is still more effective, um, even when uh, that's the case. So it is really an interesting effect. So another question, um, does the study cover the relationship between the product, food, cloth, furniture, and the touch? If so, which category gets the least or most likes? Interesting. So I'm guessing that question goes back to the Instagram photos? I believe, yes. Okay. Um, so we tested this um, at really an aggregate level. So um, all of those images uh, were aggregated across the brands. Um, so I did not look at whether or not um, specific product categories within those. We only have those four brands. Um, so I was not testing whether those product categories have differential effects. Um, so I can't actually answer that question based on, yeah. based on the data that I have. Um, but certainly someone could look into that, right? Whether or not there are certain um, certain brands or perhaps even certain industries that might benefit the most from this. Um, what I will say across a lot of the studies that we've conducted is that regardless of these product categories, um, this effect remains. So it doesn't seem like it's limited to clothing or it doesn't seem like it's limited to um, specific types of products as we've seen it occur in, in a variety of different products. And you sort of just spoke to this, but um, how about the consumer experience that deals with services? What are the main factors when it comes to those services? I'm not sure if we've gotten there yet. So what do you mean in terms of the consumer services? You know, this is an anonymous attendee who's posed this question. Otherwise, I would ask specifically, <laughs> but um, perhaps... If you are still on the webinar and that was your question, if you want to type a follow-up um, that Andrea can address better, I will look for that in the Q&A. So let's, let's move on to a different question here. Um, I was wondering, or Kathy French asks, I was wondering how our unconscious or even conscious bias might impact our connection to a vicarious experience based on the hand. And I'm wondering, she had mentioned earlier in the chat, the, the blue hand versus the non-blue hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, and it kind of gets to some of the theoretical questions that we were interested in in the first place. Um, so one thing that we know is that um, we as humans uh, construe our hands as being active entities, right? You think about it, our hands do things for us. So we've lived our entire lives 
expecting our hands to engage in the environment in a meaningful way, right? Um, humans have evolved from using the hands for locomotion to using the hands for actual intentional purposes of manipulating objects, of um, engaging with the environment, right? Our hands do quite a lot for us. So when you think about the importance of touch from that perspective, yes, we're very hardwired to actually want <laughs> meaningful interaction with our hands and for our hands to do something for us. So I think this is also part of the reason why when we see hands that are in an advertisement and they're not doing something meaningful, we don't feel connected to that, right? We th that doesn't, that's not a representation of our actual lived experience. And so um, this is part of the, the underlying reason and rationale for why touch is so effective when we see it. And then Andrea, um, if you could, some people are asking in the chat, if you could um, pop your email back up so they can oh, sure. capture that. Um, let's see, uh, Ken asks, is a physical store still better than a virtual store? Ooh, that's a loaded <laughs> Uh, oh boy. Um, <laughs> I mean, who can really answer that, right? Um, it's going to uh, it's going to depend on a whole host of of factors, um, and it's it's uh, that's <laughs> that's a very challenging question to answer. I think um, one of the things that this research reveals is that um, I mean, we all know that a lot of our consumption experiences, our interactions with the marketplace are being medi mediated by technology. And while I think, you know, an initial reaction to that might be um, aversion, right? Or, or contemplation of, well, doesn't this inhibit us from doing X, Y, or Z? I think one of the things that this research reveals is that they're really kind of amazing opportunities to foster connection, but just in different ways, right? So the way that we have consumers interacting with products or the way that we construct these environments to facilitate it for their benefit um, is something that we should kind of keep in mind. So um, rather than thinking about it as kind of this um, oppositional um, question, right? I think um, it just, it more so allows us to open up um, different avenues for finding ways to foster this engagement for consumers. Um, and then James asks, is there a way to leverage this experience in depictions of advertising non-material things like services online? Mm, oh, I see. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so we've only ever tested this phenomenon uh, with a physical tangible good, right? So for something that actually rests within one's hands. Um, I think you could ask a broader question, which is what you're getting at, is whether or not the benefits that you might reap from having an image of something in your hands might then have a halo effect on a broader service. That's an interesting question, and that's not one that's been studied to my knowledge. Um, so you could imagine, right? Like if I have um, a product that I display in my hand, right? Like a coffee mug, might I then, um, because of the positive qualities of this interaction, might it carry over into um, perceptions of, you know, maybe the, the coffee shop that I'm sitting in or a different service? I think that's certainly plausible. Um, there is uh, quite a lot of work on in, in sensory marketing on kind of these ha halo effects or carryover effects, it's particularly related to psychological ownership. So I think that's an interesting question and one for future research. Um, and then finally, last question, Andrea, for today, um, what made you want to study this? Oh, uh, so I love uh, sensory marketing. Um, I'm broadly very interested in how our lived experiences um, are carried out into these different um, virtual and digital domains. So I study this not only with, with touch, as you saw today, but I also study this with our language, how we um, translate our nonverbal communication cues into text and how we express ourselves through what we write. Um, and through what brands write to consumers. And so this has always fascinated me about, um, about these mediated experiences. And so I anticipate kind of continuing a lot of work uh, in, in these areas. 
Um, and this is not a question, but Paris Sissel says, I am a former, former student of yours, and I just wanted to say hi, and thanks for a great presentation. Uh, that's so oh, nice, Paris. That's so wonderful. A huge shout out to all of my former students. Thank you so much for being here if you are. Yes, yeah, thank you. Well, and thank you, Andrea, and thanks for everyone for attending today's Tippy webinar series presentation, Consumer Experiences in Virtual Reality. When the event ends in just a moment, you'll see a quick survey. We'd be grateful if you could share your thoughts and help us make future events even better. On behalf of the Tippy College of Business, thank you for joining us this afternoon. And as always, go Hawks.